Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Hello everybody, welcome to the second episode, the second instalment of Talking Tendons. Um, I am pleased that we are on track. Um, we are on track for, with our initial pledge of doing two episodes or around about two episodes um, of the podcast uh, per month. So far so good. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say just before we launch into the podcast this one we will uh, or you will uh, be able to find lots of um, uh, back editions of the tendinopathy blog that I've been doing um, for uh, the last few years at tendinopathyrehab.com you can also subscribe to that website which you will allow you to have um, uh, notifications of when the podcast comes out um, and there's also the tendinopathy online course on that website uh, that you can have a look at um, all right so what we're talking about today now remember we're trying to stick to 10 minutes or less with these podcasts uh, the first one was about 20 percent over that but i think i'm going to be better this time we are talking about a paper that is called non-uniform displacement and strain between the soleus gastrocnemia subtendons of rat Achilles tendon. So I don't usually go to animal models, but I just uh, I like these authors. It is uh, from Profes- Professor uh, Taya Finney um, and her team and their team. Um, so there's a, there's quite a few uh, other authors on the paper. Um, and they are uh, primarily from Finland, but some are also from the USA and Netherlands. So um, um, I like this group um, uh, from Professor Finney, led by Professor Finney. They have done some excellent uh, work over the years, over many years. So I, I, would, I, I wanted to read this and I wanted to learn more about the non-uniform strains because it is a confusing area. So let's launch into a bit of background then. What is non-uniform strain in the Achilles tendon and should we actually even care about it? Well, what we know now is that the Achilles doesn't function as just one entity. Um, When you look at, and there are multiple methods and I'm going to review them today, of uh, looking at different strain gradients within the tendon, which I think is really fascinating. Um, so it doesn't just strain as one structure. There are different gradients within there. So so there's different parts of the tendon that function in different ways. Um, and one of the questions is, um, uh, what are the drivers for that? Why does that happen? Um, is it because the properties of the tendon are different? Is it because the muscles activate in different ways? Is it differences in the moment arms? Um, so there's many reasons why this could be happening. And people are starting to look into this more and more. There are a few groups around the world doing this. And I think it's fascinating work and important work because we need to know how the tendon functions to then have a platform for going on to um, uh, investigate our exercise and other interventions so we, we really need to know how tendon functions um, so these people were interested in doing in, in investigating in rats and the reason they went to rats is because obviously they can be more invasive um, so their primary aim was to um, uh, determine whether the subtendons will undergo differential displacement and strain. Um, And the way they did this is they basically took some rats and they performed surgery on them um, and were able to, um, through that surgery, implant. um, uh, They freed all the tissues around the tendon and they were able to then um, suture on um, uh, markers onto the uh, lateral gastroc and the soleus. Okay, so you definitely could not do that in humans. 
could not get away with doing that in humans, but this is what they did in the rats. So it's, it, it will enable us to have a better insight into this, uh, this um, sort of um, uh, strain gradients that occur within the Achilles tendon. Um, so then going on with what they did, they then uh, had the rats at 120 degrees of uh, knee um, angle, sorry, knee, uh, the, sorry, the, I'll say that again, the knee angle was at 90 degrees and the ankle was set at an angle of 120 degrees. They had a, um, almost like a, you could call it a dynamometer, a load cell at the end of the foot and they could measure torque. Um, and then they wired electrodes into the soleus and into the uh, lateral gastroc and medial gastroc muscles. And basically what they did was they stimulated these muscles to contract and then they measured not only the force uh, through the load cell but also the displacement um, and the strain in the actual tendon they can do they could do that very accurately um, so so then they've worked out the strain and the displacements so strain and displacement strain is just the amount of stretch in a tendon displacement is how much um, uh, displacement is basically how much um, sort of I guess you could say in very colloquial terms up and down movement or shifting there is um, so they've measured both of those they also did an anatomical dissection after they'd euthanized the rats and they then uh, tried to differentiate the different uh, sub parts of the um, of the Achilles tendon so what did they find they uh, they found the headline finding um, one of the interesting things before I go into the headline is, is that the ankle torque when they stimulated soleus was less than when they stimulated the other muscles which I found slightly strange given soleus is such a powerhouse we know in humans it could be a difference in species um, they also uh, that was uh, that was one finding but the headline finding was that yes the soleus and the lateral gastroc subtendons do strain differently so they confirm that um, they were able to confirm that that does happen um, uh, they were also able to show that um, when the soleus was stimulated both um, the displacement and strain the soleus subtendon were significantly higher than the lateral gastroc but that didn't occur when the lateral gastroc was stimulated so even though there is um, uh, independent function there's also dependent function and that's an important point so it's, it's not always independent the way that it acts and it may vary depending on the muscle um, and the connections between those tendons um, they also found that the strain in the soleus was higher so so the so they did find the strain in the soleus was higher um, and they found that and they concluded that that's probably one of the main reasons so remember we're sort of thinking why does this happen why does this why does this sort of inter tendon strain thing happen but maybe because there's different properties of the actual tendons themselves within the within the within the achilles um, so lower stiffness in the soleus versus the lateral gastroc um, and they sort of talk about how this has been confirmed by other authors uh, but that was uh, I wasn't sure about that because the other authors have used different techniques so this is where I want to do a brief interlude into the, how these people how other people measure it if you're not going to do an animal model like these guys uh, there are basically a few ways of measuring um, intra tendon gradients or strain gradients um, or displacements one is uh, speckle tracking so using ultrasound to track um, uh, certain parts of the ultrasound using an algorithm to track certain parts of um, an ultrasound image uh, which various authors around the world have done like Franz and Thielen and Slade and Bogarts so have a look at those papers there's a few out um, other people have reconstructed three-dimensional di uh, three Achilles tendons via, via ultrasound or MRI um, and they uh, particularly with ultrasound you can do that with various isometric um, contractions so you get them to hold a contraction and then do an ultrasound scan and, and compare that to a resting state and then you can look at um, the strain of the tendon compared to force so similar types of outcomes and then finally you can also model it so mainly finite element modeling people have used to uh, model um, the strain gradients and that's the author there that comes to mind is Hansfield. I'll try and link some of these articles into the podcast notes 
um, for you to read some of these other authors that have done these other techniques. Um, so it's a really emerging area. Uh, I think it's a great paper. It's very, um, the methods are just superb the way they've, um, the, the way they've um, uh, looked at um, uh, strain gradients um, with far greater accuracy than what others have done. Um, given it's an animal model. So it confirms what we're thinking. There are some inconsistencies though. So um, one of the inconsistencies was that um, uh, in humans, um, the findings haven't been um, uh, showing, and the one inconsistency that I brought up before was the amount of uh, capacity in the ciliaus, which is different in humans. So we're on 10 minutes. I just want to finish off with some questions. Um, so always more questions than answers. Interesting work. We know that this fits into the intrafascicular matrix work um, that is out there and that is brand new and interesting. Uh, well, how does it fit in? Well, the intrafascicular matrix facilitates sliding between different parts of the tendon. Um, probably is a very good protective mechanism. Um, uh, it's a it, it, it doesn't function as well as people get older. So the intrafascicular matrix probably is relevant. Um, it allows, it facilitates, uh, it facilitates these strain gradients that we've been talking about. <clears throat> what I want to finish off with today is um, thinking about questions. And I think um, uh, always with this type of uh, early research where we're trying to understand tendon function it's going to leave us with more questions than we have answers uh, and that's okay that's the purpose of it uh, some of the important questions that we need to look at now is uh, when you've got um, uh, a stretch shorten cycle function like hopping and running how does the strain strain gradients uh, interplay when we're looking at these types of functions which are critical for development of tendinopathy so this is something that i don't think we have the technology as far as i'm aware no one's looked at it as yet um, other important questions and one of the ones that we're trying to answer in our lab is uh, what happens in pathology so so on a global level you know even if you just use the old 2d um, ultrasound measure of stiffness in the tendon what happens on that level um, what happens what about um, in pathology what happens to um, the strain gradients can you use speckle or uh, some of the modeling work to answer those questions the other thing that's been used in this space in pathology is elastography which is also very useful There's a few groups around the world doing that um, so again, we need to answer questions about what happens in pathology. And then finally, we can probably start looking at how can we apply this to uh, prevention and management, um, you know, exercise interventions. Do they make a difference um, to some of these tendon function questions? But also we're going to learn lots about uh, the etiology um, as well. So early work and unfortunately not many take-home messages, uh, but really interesting and really important work as well. Fantastic, guys. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.